And we got kind of wrapped up in examples last time, which is great, lots of questions. And so we didn't get quite as far as I hoped uh, we'd talk about, but we can make that up easily today. Um, and so we were talking about the uh, conservation of energy. And the only difference between conservation of energy and moment of momentum is that we're basically allowing for losses in the system, frictional losses. And we've talked about that in terms of Bernoulli and also in terms of, don't know how to get back from these after the fact, so I'll do that. So yeah, so that's what we were talking about from last time. And so one thing that I was lying, waking up at uh, 5.30 this morning and was li listening to NPR talking about this, which I thought was, uh, which I just looked up online. Uh, one of the examples we did on um, Monday was a kind of pump storage scheme, right? You have an upper reservoir, lower reservoir. Uh, used to be in the days, I was reminded from NPR, used to, and we talked last time, it used to be when you have nuclear power runs at the same rate all day long, or a portion of the grid was nuclear energy. You can't turn it up or turn it down, but uh, demand goes up at uh, the toasters in the morning, maybe up at a moderate amount during the day and up for dinner at night, and then nighttime it's low demand. So you smooth that out by having uh, constant power generation somewhere in the middle of those extremes, and in times when you have excess electricity, you pump water from a lower reservoir into an upper reservoir. And when you need the excess above that average value, you let it run down. And the example that we did showed you that there's always losses attached to that. Um, but that's the penalty you pay for using the pump storage scheme essentially as a big, as a big battery. So there's some controversy over this one in San Vicente, which is close to San Diego. Um, Obviously, the, well, not obviously, one of the big positives for these is that you don't have to dam a river and stop it flowing and stop the salmon migrating upstream to do this. You just need a static um, downstream pond and a static upstream pond and transfer fluids between them. Um, and therefore, ecologically, I guess it's kind of okay. The one that's close to here, if you look it up in northern Pennsylvania, is a, is a lake or a reservoir on the top of the Alleghenies and the Allegheny River, which actually is dammed all the way along its course. See a Steelers shirt here, so which goes, Allegheny ultimately goes into uh, Pittsburgh and joins the Monongahela, right? And because, and it always surprises me that we have a city that talks about three rivers. Usually when you have two rivers joining in a city or anywhere, one of the rivers that comes out is named after one of the upstream rivers, but I guess the Ohio River must have been named separately. Um, and earlier somehow for, for that in Pittsburgh. And so I didn't look any more at this other than to say that this is exactly what is planned right now. So some controversy, people will want it, people won't, uh, but it's certainly part of uh, our energy future, and of course, or energy present, I guess, and of course the energy present is the same thing, not nuclear power, although nuclear power could be one of our solutions to kind of low carbon energy, uh, except for the public uh, distaste for it, maybe. Um, and that is that with renewables, wind energy, when the wind blows, thermal PV, th PV solar, when the sun shines, but not at night, obviously. And so having storage, diurnal storage, is an important part for those things. Geothermal makes up some of that in the U.S., kind of um, fast turnover, um, natural gas turbines, which can spin up very quickly, is part of the solution to that. So anyway, lots of interesting things as part of the grid. Anyway, so that was my kind of introduction for today. Didn't look at movies, but chatted. Um, let's get to any questions from last time, he says, not looking up for any hands. No? OK. You were very chatty last time. I was quite uh, excited. <laughs> um, so as I mentioned a little earlier, we didn't get quite as far as I, I hoped. So we actually didn't cover these. Uh, it's my whole family is replying, getting ready for Canadian Thanksgiving this weekend, which we'll have people come back into town for, as I was mentioning earlier. Six days late, it was Columbus Day, or Indigenous Peoples Day in reality. So what we'll talk about today is um, we'll continue on the theme. And we'll cover two very practical things that you'll get involved in in your 
future careers, and that is uh, looking at porous media flows, environmental systems engineers for contaminant hydrology, petroleum engineers getting natural gas out of the ground, energy engineers, we have a geothermal course next semester, and we have a geothermal and other trip to New Zealand that was sent out the other day as well. Um, and mining engineers will look at uh, remediating old mines which have acid mine drainage, all part of, so it touches all of our disciplines. And we'll make the case that uh, we are talking about, for those kind of porous medium flows, we work from the idea of conservation of mass. And so we've already done this, right? This is our week number uh, six. And this ended up being uh, the sum of mass flow rates equals zero, which is this part here. I guess this should all be summations, I suppose. And for steady state case, it's just this we worry about. If it's accumulating fluid mass uh, somehow by changing either volume or changing density, then we have to worry about the left-hand side. But the steady state part is this. And so we concentrated on the idea of Reynolds transport theorem. Uh, but when we solve problems, typically we use models which use a differential format of this Reynolds transport theorem, which looks something like this equation here. And so what I want to do today is merely see where this comes from. Um, and so kind of we'll go a little bit backwards by looking at differential, so-called differential analysis. And I know that as soon as you start talking about calculus, people's minds kind of close. But let's Im imagine, well, we've kind of been doing these control volumes, which look a bit like a, a differential cube. And the only... It's nothing, of course, to be frightened of. It's just something to, to realize that it's a foundation of engineering and science for the last 200 years. And that is if we draw things in our Cartesian coordinate direction, we could have a velocity which will be in the y direction here. And we'll have a velocity outside the other side which is equal to the change in velocity in the y direction times, let me write the lengths on this. So this is a unit length in the y direction, this is a unit length in the x direction, and this is z, small lengths. And so we could multiply this by dy over dy, which if you multiplying by one just means that you're taking the velocity on this other face is going to be equal to the velocity on the upstream face. The velocity on the downstream face will be the velocity on the upstream face, this term, plus how it changes in the system. So it changes at a rate at dvy dy multiplied by the length over which that occurs. And, and really it comes from just multiplying this change in velocity by one. You can think of that. And so what we can do is we can write this mass balance equation here, and if we do that, we end up with velocity in the y direction times density times an area. Our area is dx dz, right? This is the area of this face. plus the same term, Vy, this term here, plus the rate of change of dVy in the y direction times the length over which it occurs, and again multiplied by density times an area, uh, and that's it. So what we can do is we can see what we have that repeats. So we, so, okay. So the other thing we have to do is we talked about the, the relative uh, sign convention. So it's flowing into something, so it's negative. It's flowing out from something, so it's positive. And as a result of that, we get rid of this and we get rid of this because it cancels. Uh, and we could write, rewrite this as, no great surprise, uh, 
that the sum of mass flow rates is equal to um, let's multiply by uh, Where's our other y coming from? Tx, dy. Oh yeah, we guess, I guess we've got this here. So we can rewrite this as uh, a density. A dx, dy. Sorry, dx, dz. Which is this term. We have a dy term, and we have dVy dy. That's it. And so we note that this term here is just the volume of this cube, right? And this is going somewhere. And so, and this, if it's steady state, is equal to zero. And so we end up exactly with this term here on the right side. So we've done it for one of these. If we do the same thing for the velocity in the x direction and the velocity in the z direction, so the x direction would be, this would be vx, etc. Then this conservation term here sum of momentum in the is equal to zero, just ends up being zero equals density times volume times dvx dx plus dvy dy plus dvz dz. And so this is what's called the continuity equation. It, it conserves mass. So this conserves mass, as you'd expect, because we call it conservation of mass equation. And so if we look, for instance, in one direction, then what we can do is we can write this in one direction. Then it turns out to be that dvx dx, we did it in y before, is equal to zero. We don't care about these other terms because anything times this is equal to zero. So these, we can just throw them away. And so the utility of this is that if we're looking at, say, um, flow within a porous medium, and so if you take, uh, if you fill a tube up with sand and you flow fluid within that sand and you think of what we've talked about before as, did I do, um, C0, C1, and if you looked at the height to which fluid ar arose in each of these ends, this would be P0 over gamma. And this would be P1 over gamma. This would be the height that fluid would rise above it. So you could think of this as a cylinder in the ground or a cylinder in a lab which is full of sand. And if you looked at the velocity of flow that occurred in here, and uh, we could write, uh, if we could look at these as being something that we call hydraulic head is equal to the elevation head plus P1 over unit weight. I guess we could also add this length here as V squared over 2G. So this would be at what we've called our energy grade line. The green would be what we've called our hydraulic grade line. And so in, in this, 
what the assumption is, is that one, the V squared two over two G term, in groundwater flow, the velocities are so small, we just throw them away. We don't care about them. And so if we don't care about this, what you could do is you could do an experiment where you put this cap this full of uh, sand, um, flow water through it at an elevation that's higher upstream and lower downstream, and you measure V. And you get what's called Darcy's Law after Henri Darcy of the town of Dijon in France, who apparently was the engineer who looked after the fountains of Dijon. And Darcy's Law says that velocity that you get out of this is equal to hydraulic conductivity times a head change over a length with a minus sign here. A minus sign because if you draw this out, this is head in this direction. This is the x direction. So here, a positive gradient in this space would be an angle like this, right? Positive gradient looks like this. Negative gradient is this. So a positive gradient is this. So this is definitely a positive gradient, but the flow is going in the minus x direction. So that's what that is. And we could also write this as being velocity. If we ignore the fact that these, um, that this elevation here is important, we could write this as minus permeability over viscosity, change in pressure with length. So this would be how petroleum engineers would write it. This is called uh, permeability. And it's in units of meters squared, which seems strange. But it's equivalent to the diameter of the pores. We'll talk about that later. This is viscosity. This is a pressure change from upstream to downstream. And this is uh, what environmental systems engineers would use, which is called hydraulic conductivity, sometimes called coefficient of permeability and sometimes incorrectly called permeability. But the units of this are meters per second, the velocity, which makes more sense, right? This is a velocity, this is a kind of velocity, and this is a, 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 a length over length, which is dimensionless, which says that the higher this gradient is, the faster the flow rate would be. And so it may seem a bit random, we mentioning those things, but what we can do with this and I'll find it easier to do with this one first, is we could just throw it into here. And so if I write porous media flows, or porous medium flows, flows in porous media, we do exactly that. And so what we do is if we substitute, we end up with D, well, let me write that. I'm going to write it in terms of this. Which we could rewrite, which is what we solve, which we could also write as K d to h d x squared. And so we have a PD that we can solve, and that's how all computer models work. So the important, or an interesting thing here, is that the equation that we've substituted this into has only been a conservation of mass equation. We wrote it up here, that that's exactly what it is. And so really, it, it doesn't account for the, the physics of what's going on. So what we've done is we've used kind of an empirical law that includes the effects of viscous losses, fluid going past the grains, the grains dragging against the fluid to slow it down. And of course, um, in a system, uh, in Bernoulli's system, where we don't have head losses, 
we wouldn't be able to have a different pressure downstream from upstream because Bernoulli would tell us without the head loss term, H sub L, that they should be equivalent. There should be no loss across the system. But the essence of viscous losses is that there is some drag. And so we've kind of empirically included it through this law, uh, which has allowed us to represent that. And so that ends up being a useful way of doing it. But it's important for us to realize that we've only used conservation of mass and kind of a kludged law, effective. This effectively represents H sub L in our Bernoulli equation. So that's important to realize. And so uh, what we could do is we could try and use this equation to solve some, some problems. And we'll call this uh, flow nets. And it's really an incredibly powerful technique. And you, if you're taking 452, which you won't be probably uh, in your career right now, but you might be in your senior year for environmental systems engineer. If you're taking out of sequence, you might have seen this already. And the idea is that we can use this equation or Darcy's law to be able to solve for a flow within a, a net. And so the idea is that uh, we can use it for flow in porous media, but we can also use it for flows in other systems. So obviously this isn't a porous medium. We don't fly planes through porous media. We fly them through the atmosphere. And we've kind of drawn these we, we perhaps haven't drawn this net around it, but we can. And if you go, uh, I'll let you draw that. You could probably remember kind of what that looks like. You could imagine that if we took a geological structure like a dam, we could draw a similar flow net that goes from upstream to downstream, which is what we're emulating. And the important thing about that is that we can show that for this particular equation, which I guess is the two-dimensional version of this, right? So we can just, we can use the x direction by substituting Darcy's law. We can substitute Darcy's law into this one. If the y direction is into the page, then we don't need this term. And so we end up with two terms, and they will look like this once we've substituted Darcy's law. And so the important thing to realize is that this is called a Laplace equation. After Simon de Laplace, I guess, the famous uh, French mathematician. And the only important thing is that we can make a flow net in a porous medium, and it has to satisfy two things. I could take a, a portion out of this, maybe, with a different color. And I'll draw it here. Uh, we'll do, I'll do it this way. Oh, I didn't mean to use purple, but I've got purple, fuchsia. So you can imagine flow between two streamlines, and you could imagine uh, these other things. And so we'll call these black things equipotentials, equal potentials, and we'll call the other things flow lines. Call them streamlines if you want. We've talked about stream tubes for Bernoulli. So a stream tube would be between these two flow lines. And the only th important thing about this is that these form at right angles. And that they define a couple of lengths. They define a length here, which I'll call dl. And they form a width dw, and they have a velocity at which stuff flows. And I'll define these in terms of two heads, h0 and h1, right? So remember, 
we talked about the head being the sum of the elevation head and the pressure head where we throw away the velocity head. So that's what these are here. And we can do something very simple with this. And that is that we can take Darcy's law. We'll forget that the negative term is here. We don't need it because we're summing it e equal to 0. And so this would be hydraulic conductivity dH dx. And I could write the volumetric flow rate, which is equal to the product of the velocity times an area, which is going to be equal to dW, right? this term here. This is the cross-sectional area, times 1 into the page, times k dH dL, right? how head changes over this. Um, which is equal to dW over dL times K times delta H. And so in writing it that way, it's a very short derivation. We said this has to be um, 90 degrees to each other. We also have to keep these lengths e equivalent to make it a square net. It can't be with big aspect ratios. So if that's the case, then this ratio here is about 1. And so we have volumetric flow rate is equal to hydraulic conductivity times delta H. And so if I draw this out to now draw an entire net that goes from Let's see how I'm going to draw. I'm going to draw. Let me use the same colors so it looks the same. Say if I'm looking at flow along a given length from upstream to downstream, then the flow net that I'd have would be something like this. Don't know how many of these are going to fit. This many, I guess. Let me think of this line here that I'm drawing here to be a pressure. You can think of this as being a pressure differential between the upstream and downstream. I could draw the, the Z on it as well if you wanted to, right? So this would be I guess I should include both of these, z not equal to 0, but constant. And if that's the case, then I suppose this whole height should be z. But don't worry about that for now. This is enough to get the idea across. So we can get the flow rate out of, coming out of this stream tube if we know what delta h is over the total system. And um, we can take delta h as being equal to um, uh, we need delta H being one of these individual delta H's. Uh, so I guess this would be actually not delta H, but H0 minus H1, right? So it's the delta H between one of these things upstream. And so we could get that value uh, as being equal to hydraulic conductivity times the total delta H. This actually is H0 minus H1, which would be H0, H1, is equal to the whole thing divided by the number of drops. So this would be 0. This would be 1 drop, 2 drops, 3 drops, 4 drops, 5, and ND. What are I called ND? So that would be 6. So the incremental drop is going to be equal to the total drop divided by how many incremental ones. And that would be the flow rate out of one tube. And so the sum of flow rates, if we had another, if we had a whole bunch of tubes that instead of being this one tube, 
that we've just drawn was going on relative to another tube. Look like this. So I'm just expanding the one on top. Two. A lot of drawing today. And I'll number these as one, two, three. Number of stream tubes equals three. And so the sum of Q is equal to Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3. Each of them have to be carrying the same fluid because of the way that we've defined this. This would be V1, V2, etc. And so bottom line is that the sum of the flow rates has to equal the number of stream tubes times Q, which equals the number of stream tubes times delta H over number of drops. And I've missed out the K somewhere. So a pretty straightforward derivation, but a really powerful method that says that if you want to get the volumetric flow rate through something, you can get it from knowing the hydraulic conductivity, knowing what the total head drop across the system is, and being able to draw this flow net that satisfies the boundary conditions. And so the boundary conditions would be, if I do this as a big fat one, Really fat. This is H0. It's a bit fat. <laughs> this is <laughs> H6. And these are constant values of head, right? Because, uh, well, and the other boundary conditions that we honor are that this is a no flow boundary. So it has to be, by definition, a streamline. This is a no-flow boundary here. So by definition, it has to be a streamline. Just like on our airfoil, right? This is kind of a no-flow boundary. No flow is going across this boundary. Same about this. And that all these blocks here satisfy two conditions. They're re relatively perpendicular to each other. And they're also equiaxed. That this length is equal to this. That's it. So an incredibly powerful method that you can use to, to do this. And so I'll just go through a quick example to kind of reinforce that. But the bottom line is that we're just using this expression here. And so we'll go back to the figure that I just kind of flicked forward to in the notes to kind of reinforce that. Maybe I'll make my green a little less blunt. Um, although it is kind of nice, isn't it? We can afford to go here to make the point I want to. And so this is the flow net. It's a bit more complicated. Uh, we could imagine that this would be a no flow boundary on the bottom. So by definition, it has to be a streamline. This is a free surface. That makes things a bit more complicated. So this also has to be the uppermost streamline uh, that we're dealing with. And so this has to be kind of a funky streamline in that for our geometry here, it has to go here, then it has to come up here, which is a bit inconvenient. This also has to be a streamline on the top, which we don't really know where it is, but we can guess. And then we have to draw this net that fills these in. And so this net needs to be bounded by the other requirements. So let me get rid of this green no flow boundary on the bottom because perhaps it's better using red because I want to use green for something else. So the green is for the, the so we said we had streamlines and we have equipotentials. Equipotentials are the ones that are perpendicular to that. So this is of course an equipotential here on this boundary. And the easiest way to show that to ourselves is that if we drew this line here, we know exactly that this is our swimming pool line. 
where this here is equal to, let me do it further up. You know that this is equal to P0 over gamma, right? Pressure at the free surface is the atmosphere. Happens to be in sand, but it's like a swimming pool. As you go down here, it's uh, static, the same as being in a swimming pool. And if we go upwards from here, if this is our datum, where z is equal to 0 on this, and z is positive upwards, then you can think of this as being should do it here, right? This is z, right? And so together, p0 over gamma plus, a, plus z is equal to what we've called h. And so since these add together to be the same, so z is, is 0 here, this length, and as you come up to here, it's equal to whatever this elevation is. And this elevation relative to this datum is equal to the hydraulic head of this free surface. And, it's, and the, pot, the bottom line is that because they both sum up to this prism, which is the same value all the way down here as you go down here, the sum of these two is the same, this has to be, by definition, an equipotential. So we have an equipotential. And H0 is equal to just this, this height. This is H0. And by definition, it has to be an equipotential. We can make the similar argument for this place here, right? This is sitting under the water. So I guess the pressure head would be equal to the height of water here. And the elevation head of this would just be equal to the uh, the elevation head would just be equal to z. This is a bit more obvious because it's a straight line. This would be z9, and this would be, I'm trying to keep my color straight, this would be p9 over unit weight, this height here. So well, I guess all we've done is we've made the point that these should be equipotentials, this green line here and this green line here. We have some upper and lower streamlines. This is our upper stream, oops. This is our upper streamline here. And this is our lower streamline here. And we have to fill in the rest to be able to look like a, an equidimensional net. And so this is my attempt at doing that. And if you agree that it satisfies, most of these are kind of right angles. Most of these are kind of equidimensional. And actually in this, we have another requirement is that each of the stair steps on this curve have to be roughly the same increment. It has to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, Nine, well, I guess zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then there isn't one here. These have to be roughly equal magnitudes, so it's an extra constraint. But the point of this all is, is that if we want to calculate what the flow rate through this, it's just equal to Q times the hydraulic conductivity. I don't know. Uh, Ten to the minus two meters per second, say, I don't know. The head drop times the number of stream tubes divided by the number of drops. And so this goes to being K. Delta H is just going to be H0 minus H9. And so in other words, H9 is physically this height here. H0 is physically this height here, so it's a positive value. And number of stream tubes over number of drops is easy. Stream tubes. 
One, two, three, four. And number of drops. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So we immediately know that our flow rate is roughly 10 to the minus 2 meters a second times whatever h0 minus h9 is. Uh, I don't know. What, how tall is a dam? A small dam would be 10 meters, right? 30 feet. The height of three stories, 10 meters and a half, four over nine. Not a bit more than a half, a bit less than a half. And you have your flow rate. Pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool anyway. So it's a very easy thing to do to be able to calculate that. Uh, it works for porous media flows. Um, it works for kind of being able to do calculations. The streamline area idea that if you have an equation that is d something d two h d z squared. If you ever have an equation that looks like this, you can always solve it with this orthogonal nets. So if so, if you look in your textbook, you'll see that there are some examples of flows around airfoils, which we tried drawing here. They f they also satisfy this equation here. They're not porous media flows, but one of the degenerative forms of what we'll talk about today is the Navier-Stokes equations that represents free flows, so flows like blowing across the top of my hand where there's no porous media that I'm moving air in would also conform to this behavior. So, so that's a powerful method that you will be able to invoke. Uh, it's kind of explained here. And I suppose the important thing to realize is that in using Darcy's law and flow nets, we haven't done anything other than invoke conservation of mass. We haven't done anything like invoke conservation of momentum. If you want to deal with problems which are like the ones that we looked at in the videos, so I'm thinking of, uh, of these ones that we looked at before, where you have water flowing in air, then you can't use something as simple as conservation of mass in Darcy's law because it, there's much more, it's much more complex. And the reason it's much more complex is what we've done is we've thrown away the v squared over 2g term, says it's inconsequential. And if you look at any of these examples that we've looked at here, the velocity term may not be inconsequential. We know if we're flowing in tightly packed porous media, velocity is small, the frictional losses due to viscosity are huge, and therefore we don't need to worry about um, uh, anything in terms of the v squared over 2g term. We need to worry about the head losses and the pressure losses due to friction and the fact that friction occurs. If we want to solve problems like this, we can't do that without reverting to using both conservation of mass and conservation of momentum. And it's not worth me spending time deriving these things here, I don't think. I think it, it falls kind of on deaf ears. Um, but it is perhaps worthwhile saying something about it, and just to make the case of what's going on. And all I'll do, uh, apart from uh, confusing you perhaps, is to make the case that if we want to solve, um, I'm, I'm just going to write something here close to these equations. If we want to solve for open flows, then we have to use two things. We have to solve for conservation of mass. And we have to solve for conservation 
of momentum. And so this is one equation. This is three equations. And so what we would solve for is that in x, y, and z, we'd solve for velocity, jeez, oh, blunt instrument. We'd solve for velocities in x, which are called, uh, in these equations, u. Velocities in y, which in these qu equations are called v, and velocities in z, which are called w. So this is vz, which we've called vz, right? And we solve, I'm going to reset this from being a blunt instrument to being a, a regular one. And we solve for a pressure. So we have four variables pressure and velocities in x, y, and z. We have four equations. And so we can, in theory, solve for, um, solve, solve for the unknowns. And so just the equations look just like the equations that you see here, super complicated. You'll see that they involve a velocity in the x direction, a velocity in the y direction, and a velocity in the z direction. These ones here are due to conservation of mv, momentum, three of them, in differential form. So all we've done is we've gone and written the equations on a control volume that happens to be a little differential cube, just like we did before for Darcy's law. And we end up with these complicated equations. And continuity equation, which is conservation of mass. And this is, if we write it out, this is d dx rho vx equals zero. This is just the differential operator. If we have three terms, it would just be dx plus dy plus dz times rho vx. This is exactly the equation we started off from by deriving today. And if we look at this very complicated equation, what we can do is we can divide it up into the parts which kind of make sense to us. If we write it in terms of Bernoulli equation, this term here is pressure head. This term here is elevation head. This term here is a density times an acceleration. So this is mass times acceleration, which we've said is equivalent to v squared over 2g. So all of these terms are that. And this term here is equal to a head loss. It's a viscosity times a gradient of velocity. And it just allows us to use the fact that shear force is equal to viscosity times dvx dy or whatever, right? This is Newton's law of viscosity. And so these terms individually for the x direction, for the, well, it says it here, x direction, y direction, and z direction are just Bernoulli's equation with the head loss, which is the energy equation. And there's one for one-dimensional flows in the x direction, one-dimensional flows in the y direction, and one dimension of flows. So, so we're never going to ask you to solve these, but they, they do kind of fit into what we're trying to do here. And therefore, the kind of flows we just looked at, flows of water across the lighthouse, where water is flowing freely, not in a porous medium, and where the values of this term, v squared over 2g, aren't so small that we can throw it away. And so that's the, the difference. So you might use these kinds of equations for solving problems of how quickly does um, air go down this uh, tunnel or this uh, mine roadway, because the velocity terms are large, 
and you're not in the porous medium if you're flowing down a tunnel because you've excavated the porous medium out. And the only final thing for me to say is that, so if you solve these equations, you solve them using models, like we looked at in those examples uh, for the behavior of around a lighthouse or squirting water out of a fire hose. But for very simple geometries, you can get closed form solutions. And there are a couple that perhaps are worthwhile just jotting down before we leave. And maybe I'll do that back if we have some space on this. And so, yeah, we have lots of space. God, it's very economical today. And so if we talk about open, open flows, and we'll call these the Navier-Stokes equations. And remember there, one conservation of mass and three conservation of momentum, named after George Stokes, who's a hydrodynamicist from the Britain 1800s, Navier, who's a, a famous um, French uh, mathematician. And the idea is that we could look at flow within a duct. We could look at changes in pressure between upstream and downstream. And we can get um, velocities out of this. So actually the velocity within this conduit will look like this. Not very good. This is the true velocity. If we make that into an average velocity, where you just take the total So I'll call this V bar, average. So this is the average. Then we can write down a couple of equations. One is for if this is a duct. And this, oh, whoops, terrible. And if this duct has a separation which is 2b, and then the velocity in the x direction is just equal to the aperture of this duct squared divided by 12 times dynamic viscosity times dp dx. And the other condition that we could imagine is if it's flowing oh man, in a tube, and the tube happens to be of diameter 2r, then ux bar, the average flow velocity, is going to be equal to actually something very similar, 2r all squared over 32 times viscosity dp dx. And it may seem very esoteric to write them that way, but if we, one of the reasons for doing this is that we can imagine, you know, one of the very first movies we looked at was this in-grain movie, you remember, it had the blobs of fluid flowing in a porous medium from upstream to downstream. So what we could do, if we know what the diameters are of these little tubes that are going through here, if these diameters are equal to 2r equals d, we could actually work out that the permeability of that system is equal to porosity 
times uh, d squared over 32. So we could think of this being a whole bundle of capillaries, little capillary tubes, which were individually flowing through and through. We do some uh, analysis, and porosity is just equal to the volume of the pore space over the total volume. How much of it's open versus the total volume of this cube is the ratio. You'll, you'll see this in your other stuff. You probably already know what porosity is. And so these are standard results that we can use. It also turns out that if you have a fractured medium, the permeability of that fractured medium, if the fractures are spaced a distance s apart, and the aperture of them is 2b, then the permeability of this system is equal to uh, 2b cubed over 12 times the spacing. Uh, length, length cubed, and you remember permeability was equal to uh, length squared. Um, and we can always, and we talked about hydraulic conductivity, and we talked about permeability. The two are linked through this expression. Not relevant to this class, but maybe relevant to your other classes. This is permeability. For petroleum engineers in meters squared. And this is hydraulic conductivity, which is a velocity. Dynamic viscosity of the fluid, density of the fluid, gravity, this planet. And so, so anyway, so if you ever wondered whether any of the stuff you do in your first two years or two and a half years is relevant to what you might do as a professional, then here's, here's the kind of linkage, finally. So, so, so that's it.